Hello, my name is Erin Young. I'm the Water Resources Manager for the City of Flagstaff. And you are listening to a presentation on Flagstaff's water management program and how we are moving towards a sustainable future, starting with a goal to recycle 100% of our treated effluent back into the community. This presentation was prepared with the Reclaimed Water Master Plan in mind. As background information, the Community Stakeholder Committee on Reclaimed Water may find useful as they work together to prioritize the various options the city has for recycling 100% of our treated effluent. Whether through additional direct reuse as reclaimed water, as we've been doing for decades, uh, or through recharge and recovery through the aquifer, or surface water augmentation to Upper Lake Mary, or even as drinking water through direct reuse as potable water. This presentation touches on four areas, where our water comes from, a history of water management in Flagstaff, our designation of adequate water supply, which is our current water planning framework through the Department of Water Resources, and details of the Reclaimed Water Master Plan. And each areas of this talk are provided in separate video links on our website. Okay, so where do, do our water supplies come from? The first supplies developed are really no surprise, surface water, um, and these early supply sources we're, we're not utilizing anymore. Uh, but I think it's important to mention that um, early settlers developed O'Neill Spring near Kachina Village and piped that water to Flagstaff for the railroad and, and the lumber industry. And Old Town Spring west of downtown on Lower Coconino Avenue was an early water supply. Uh, there's a really neat park there and some information on history of, of this space. And um, it's a nice place to visit, especially when the water is flowing. And in the late 1800s, the lumber industry turned to the inner basin of the San Francisco peaks for water. Um, although I'm sure planning started sooner in order to construct a 13 mile pipeline from the inner basin down to four that was located as locals know it as the Y, the junction of Eldon Lookout Road and Schultz Pass Road located sort of near the Museum of Northern Arizona. And uh, we have a photo down on the lower right showing, you know, uh, hard labor and mules constructing that uh, 13 mile pipeline in the Waterline Road way back then. Uh, so the lumber company secured use of about 40 or 50 springs. And that's just a number off the top of my head. I don't know the actual number, but the city acquired those water rights from the lumber industry in the early 1900s. And it, it the sediments in the inner ba basin are comprised of alluvial, fluvial, glacial sediments that in many areas are very porous. And the spring water sort of quickly infiltrates into the ground naturally and underneath have these engineered infiltration galleries were installed to collect water into the pipeline and bring it down to the reservoir at the Y. And we still use that location today to actually uh, filter and disinfect water from the inner basin, including water from wells. And it wasn't until the 1960s that these well houses um, were put in we have um, three operating wells currently in the inner basin, although I think they may be drilled six or so at the time. If you're interested in more history on this, I encourage you to check out Gwendolyn Waring's book on the natural history of the San Francisco peaks. Uh, she completed a lot of research on the geomorphology and the history of water production from the inner basin and I bet her book has a lot of great tidbits of information if you're if you'd like to know more. Uh, in the early 1900s the surface water supply wasn't enough for the growing community and a, a dam was built at Lower Lake Mary what is now Lower Lake Mary and the dam was built into uh, Walnut Creek and 
that was all great and good, but after some time, it was discovered, I imagine it was discovered after the fact, that um, water was draining into these sinkholes. And it's possible that after the dam was built, water started to fill the lake and then eroded down into, through the soil to areas where uh, um, these karst features and sinkholes were existing under the land surface. So here's an example of one of these. And this one is located south of the dam. There's a forest service road that sort of uh, runs along the southern edge of Lower Lake Mary, and you can drive on that road and walk out to these features. So here's a And you can see that water at the bottom there is, is flowing into a, a pretty wide fracture, maybe uh, six inches to a foot wide, and that's in the Kaibab limestone. It's fractures like those that we aim to target for when we're drilling wells uh, below the water table, which is in a lot of areas of Flagstaff, 1,500 feet below land surface is this regional sea aquifer. So it's the fracture flow that yields several hundred gallons a minute, even to 1,200 gallons a minute at some of our water wells. With the discovery of these sinkholes at in the Lower Lake Mary area, Upper Lake Mary Dam was constructed in 1941. And here's a photo looking to the northwest from sort of uh, the, the Mormon Lake area. Mormon Lake is just to the left of the photo. Um, looking across Upper Lake Mary, here's the dam and the Narrows area. Newman Canyon is, this in, is in this area. And this is Lower Lake Mary. I wanted to provide just some words from the times. Um, I just, I love that the Daily Sun will pull up all this uh, cool history and publish it in our, our paper through time. And this article happens to be from Don Perry that he saved from 1986. And Don Perry is a local Flagstaff guy who uh, was part of the Perry brothers drilling, um, drilled a whole bunch of our water wells. So in 1934, the water train arrives today so we can all take a shower. They had to haul water and barrels from City Lake Park to water the trees on campus. And I love that in 1938, um, I imagine this conversation was about Upper Lake Mary and equipping it with a pipeline. Um, it may have been Lower Lake Mary, I'm not sure, but council members were sort of deliberating on whether a six inch pipeline or 12 inch pipeline was sufficient. And one council member said, a six inch pipeline from Lake Mary will supply all the water Flagstaff will ever need. And I bet they would love to see Flagstaff today, uh, whether they'd be impressed or not. Um, but you know, our pipeline sizes, I, we have some 24 inch from the Lake Mary area and we ha even have a 36 inch diameter pipe. So, um, Planning for the future is important. And then coming into the 1950s, this is sort of the trigger when Flagstaff began a well drilling campaign for local wells. In 1952, a conversation was going on on whether we could drill wells at loop and lay a pipeline in the trench being dug for the El Paso gas line to the reservoirs in town. Now that was a $1.8 million cost estimate. El Paso Gas said it wasn't possible, um, but I had no idea that the city had, you know, been discussing ideas like this, you know, uh, way back in the 50s. Um, Red Gap Ranch, you know, now that I think about it, it's not such an outlandish idea. Maybe it's an idea that had sort of been tossed around through time. Um, in 1953, Flops Dunham, quite a name for a water department superintendent, he commented that loop is 2,000 feet lower, and to reach water there, you drill 600 feet. Maybe if we drill the 2,600 feet right here, we can find water. I think this is before the time that the regional aquifer was, was understood. The sea aquifer, you know, extends, as we know it today, extends from uh, just west of Flagstaff, 
sort of to the Mogollon Rim to the south and all the way to the Four Corners area. We know that because of well data, putting holes in the ground uh, that go through the sea aquifer, even into the R aquifer. That's how we can map out the spatial extent of the aquifer. So back in 1953, they did not have a map of the sea aquifer. So I just love this comment that they were thinking about it. However, they wanted to investigate based on qualified information. So the city retained Dr. John Harshbarger um, as a geologist to do a complete evaluation of our area for $2,500. And then Dr. Harshbarger did locate areas to drill along an escarpment in the Woody Mountain area, uh, basically extensions of like the Oak Creek fault system. And Perry Brothers provided a bid to us for $5,200 to drill to 2,500 feet and test and equip the well. We budget two to two and a half million today to do that same set of work. So, um, and to the same depth. Um, and in 1955, just after Woody Mountain number one was drilled and after it was a successful well, Lake Mary dried up almost to the day we could pump from Woody Mountain. So, you know, we've had so many water challenges through the history of Flagstaff and we've, um, we've mitigated a whole lot of issues over time. Um, and here's a picture, a memorial to Dr. Harshbarger and then some uh, folks enjoying water out of Woody Mountain One. I think that gentleman holding the cup is, I think J James Clevinger, and I think he was the superintendent at the time, but I couldn't find my notes to know for sure. Uh, I don't think it's flops, but I might be wrong. Uh, so Woody Mountain number two was drilled soon after number one. They had 375 gallons a minute. Um, they were having sand issues with the well. We want to keep sand out of the water because it eats up our water pumps. And they mitigated the sand issues, turned the well over to the city, and collectively the two wells provided half of the city's water demand back then. And on the right is a hand-drawn completion diagram of a well that was uh, drawn and sketched by Perry Brothers drilling. So I took a picture of that when I visited Don a, about a year ago to go through all of his inf all of his information on um, water supply stuff over the year, that he's collected over the years. Uh, so here I, I want to provide just um, an idea of groundwater development over time. Um, and put into perspective sort of how many wells we have and how challenging it's been for the city uh, to locate and drill all these wells. So on the right is a chronological order of all of our water production wells and kind of the spatial extent of these. Uh, the first area explored, as I mentioned previously, is this Woody Mountain area, and you can see the blue dots are all of the, the water wells in the Woody Mountain well field. They all feed a single transmission line that joins the greater city water distribution system. We test the water quality at one location of all the water collectively. Um, that is called an entry point to the distribution system. And I think we have nine all around the city. Every place that a new water supply comes in, it must be tested pretty extensively for, for water quality. Um, so that th those wells were located along this escarpment, which does match up with the Oak Creek fault system. If you're driving down 89A on the switchbacks, you, you drive right over the Oak Creek Fault. Um, it's important that, you know, all of our wells pump from the Little Colorado River groundwater basin, uh, but we're very close to, to the divide with the Verde groundwater basin. So the Verde basin feeds like Sterling Springs in Oak Creek. Um, and this is a whole nother conversation, but we do have groundwater flow models. We have a lot of, we're collecting a lot of data because we don't want our groundwater pumping to intercept water that, um, or to impact spring flow or discharges to areas, for instance, along 
Clear Creek and Chevron Creek east of Flagstaff. So we're very proactive in, in collecting da data and analyzing it for our, to understand our impact and then to mitigate our impact. So I am going off on a tangent. Uh, the Lake Mary well field was drilled uh, starting in the 60s. And again, these wells were targeting fault, uh, faults and fractures at depth. Uh, just to note, it was around this time that reclaimed water was first used from Continental Country Club after uh, the Wildcat Hill Water Reclamation Plant, which is located right at Picture Canyon. When that was constructed, um, the golf industry sort of is, is a driving uh, leader in using recycled water. Uh, in their industry that is very common in the southwestern U.S. So we do have them to thank in advancing reusing reusing water. Uh, inner basin wells started to be drilled in the 60s and I think it was maybe over 10 years that they drilled I think maybe six or so wells. We have three operating today and here's a photo of the rig. Uh, as a wilderness area I can't imagine we would ever be drilling in the inner basin ever again. <laughs> um, but we've got what we've got there. Those wells are several hundred feet deep and you know the inner basin is at a much higher elevation than Flagstaff, maybe nine to 9,500 feet or so are the elevation of the wells. And the wells are only several hundred feet deep. They penetrate unconsolidated sediments that collect and store water from snow melt um, on top of volcanic bedrock. The reclaimed water system, just to note a point in time in 1993, that's when the Rio water reclamation plant was built and the, the um, purple pipe as we know it today is serving uh, Buffalo Park and Park Tank, at least it's just a storage tank. We don't put any water um, up to irrigate anything at Buffalo Park, there's no irrigation, but we serve uh, city parks and schools, a lot of them, not all of them. NAU, Pine Canyon, those are some of our bigger customers. And Snowbowl, of course, um, we haven't really changed much of that system since it was built in 1993. And it wasn't until 1997 that we began drilling within city limits. So this circle represents sort of our city, uh, what we call the inner city wells. And so for 100 years, really, or over 100 years or so, uh, the city had been importing water from outside of city limits. And thinking of this through time and how we've, how we've grown on our water supplies, I think this graph is super fun because it shows the picture of, of our growth, how we've been able to grow. Um, we've always sort of used what water we can get from the inner basin springs. Um, the volume is an acre feet of water. And again, an acre is roughly the size of a football field. And then one foot deep of water is an acre foot. Uh, acre foot contains 325,000, almost 326,000 gallons. Uh, Upper Lake Mary was pretty heavily relied on until about 1988. And since that time, we've used the supply differently. Um, so a lot of factors, you know, climate um, factor in and just how much precipitation we've been getting over kind of the decadal scale and things like that. Um, but a huge shift from kind of maximizing what we can get from Upper Lake Mary to relying on our groundwater supply. I show reclaimed water here. It's important because if we were not using reclaimed water, uh, the purple area would be orange. At least we would, I imagine, NAU would still be watering outdoors even without reclaimed water. We wanna water our parks and schools. Um, SCA was on reclaimed water before they closed down. Um, and so, and uh, Snowball is taking reclaimed water. Um, so purple pipe water provides about 20% of the overall water supply um, that we supply to all of our customers. So that's a huge uh, sort of water conservation uh, achievement. 
And I, I note water conservation here because these dates were kind of really big, important points in time when our city council took action to conserve water. Prior to 1988, our water rate was a single water rate no matter who you were in the city. If you were a commercial customer um, or, um, or a residential customer. So they divided into some customer classes. They elected a tiered water rate. So the more volume you use, the more you pay for that volume over a certain sort of base amount of water. So your base amount of water is cheaper, but the idea is that if you're using more than the base amount, you might be using it for outdoor irrigation so that higher water rate encourages water conservation. At this time, they adopted four water availability strategies um, to deal with uh, curtailment. If, if we needed to ask our customers to curtail, why would we do that? Sort of a water emergency, we're out of water for some reason. It's either a drought that dries up our surface water supplies and we don't have enough groundwater wells to meet demand, um, or we've had, let's say, a forest fire that takes out uh, one, our, one of our transmission mains, maybe from the Woody Mountain well field. So we, they developed those four water availability strategies. Um, now, the next, oh, well, let me also add that in 1991, we started a toilet rebate program. So toilets use a lot of water and uh, over time, technology keeps improving. We encourage today uh, rebates for water sense labeled toilets. It's sort of the equivalent of Energy Star. Water sense toilets work really well. I'm just making a plug for them. Um, they, they've been tested for efficacy. And anyway, we still manage a toilet rebate program. Um, those are kind of some of the big early actions that were taken prior to 2003, which was another big um, time for water conservation after a drought in 2002, where we actually had to implement those water availability strategies we were really low on lake water um, and we did not have all of our wells operating. We had some issues and that we were drilling emergency water wells and they're not something that go in quickly uh, into the ground quickly when you're drilling 2,500 feet. Um, so we asked the community to curtail and at the time it was really hard to get the message out. Um, our, our level one was use water as you wish and level two was odd even watering days, not watering between nine and five, um, and actions like that. Well, without a water conservation program, we had a difficult time getting the message out. We had a difficult time enforcing our city code. There, We had no staff that were dedicated to that. So after this sort of water crisis ended, our water commission and city council elected to establish our water conservation program as we know it today. Today we have two full-time staff and we have a lot of part-time staff, including dedicated staff in the summer, to kind of patrol, remind people of our watering code um, and the importance of it. And since, since that time in 2002, we have not gone into our water availability strategies, um, although we, uh, Water Commission and Council also elected to get rid of water water level one, uh, which was water as you wish. And now we always are in uh, the odd even watering days and uh, no watering between nine and five, no watering on Monday. And that was designed to keep the, uh, to keep our customers sort of on alert that, oh yeah, you know, we have some watering restrictions. That way, if we have to elevate to a water emergency, hopefully we can get their attention and they'll curtail their water use to help us with um, providing uh, basic water or water for basic needs to our community. So that's kind of a long-winded uh, discussion on this slide. So we've talked about groundwater system impact. We're pumping a lot of groundwater and we monitor our, our impacts. And um, this is called a hydrograph. We're looking at water levels over time. Uh, time here, this would be 1996 to 2020. 
and we have uh, water level elevation and the depth to water below land surface. And each of these graphs are on the same scale, just so your eye can compare trends more easily. And um, let's see here. So we're looking at our local wells. We didn't start drilling these until the late 90s. And so that's the record we have on, on trends. Um, we don't see a lot of drawdown in our local wells. Uh, and the aquifer is like a thousand feet thick, plus or minus. A lot of times we don't know the bottom of the aquifer to know how thick it is, but we only know how thick it is from uh, the depth of the well at that point in space. And our trend lines really kind of hover around a foot to a foot and a half of drawdown a year with the exception of, I'm sorry, let me go back, the shop well. This well is one of our most productive water wells at I think 900 gallons a minute. We operate this well 24-7, 365. We rarely shut it down. It We may have a uh, drawdown of five feet per year, um, but the water levels we get have to be under non-pumping conditions. It's called a static or a relaxed water level. You have to let the water table rebound to get a, to get a value and so we our water production staff know that i love these water levels so if they ever do shut down the water well they give me a read but the inconsistency here in levels kind of reflects that there's a lot of pumping influence on these levels so they're just we can't really trust them super well but in general the water table isn't dropping very fast in within city limits. Now, the Woody Mountain Well Field is similar in that we have a much longer record from the 1950s, and the trends are about a foot a year or less. Um, the area just recharges itself pretty quickly, and um, but it's still important to, uh, to monitor and to understand that you know, we're still pulling water out of the impact, which is out of the aquifer, which is having an impact somewhere. So um, we're doing a lot of data collection. Now, the Lake Mary area is different. Uh, the aquifer system there seems to be a bit fragmented. We find water as we're drilling at many different um, levels, sort of, we might go through some unsaturated areas as they're drilling um, to get to what are called, um, well, just kind of localized lenses of water that maybe aren't part of a regional flow system. This area is just a bit um, tricky, I think, to evaluate in terms of uh, our impact to the aquifer, but we do know that we have some indications of really no uh, drawdown trends, which the northwest side of the the lake, lower Lake Mary, our well number three is pretty static. Um, however, we we see some wells at you know three and a half feet per year drawdown, and then we have some that see ten feet of drawdown a year, and that is not sustainable. So our our staff are working on relaxing pumping from the Lake Mary well field. Um, this would be a this is a great candidate area for recharge and we're talking about you know what can we do with this volume of reclaimed water we have you know it's we have 3000 to 4500 acre feet a year that's a lot of water and where can we make the biggest impact with that water supply um so i want to make a plug for a couple of the options you guys are considering aquifer recharge and recovery. I just want to explain a little bit about kind of the hydrology of that option um, or the approach. What we're looking at here is um, a topographic map of the water table at a point in time. This is from like 2015 and all the blue dots are water wells, places where we know the depth to the aquifer and that those water levels are contoured so you can see the areas of recharge or where the water table is higher and lower in elevation. Um, the flow lines represent 
the direction of groundwater flow. So we need to recharge our wells and the aquifer upgradient of a well in order to recover that water. And in one way, recharge is a paper exercise. We know we're putting X volume of water into the ground, and then we're pulling X volume out at another point. However, we can monitor our water, our water wells for increasing water levels to see that recharge is indeed impacting the areas that we expect. Um, so right now we're running a test of releasing reclaimed water at locations uh, around that are along our reclaimed water line um, that can, um, cross a wash where we can release water upgrading of our wells. And just to give you an idea, um, our reclaimed water system is sort of in the shape of a C. This is where um, the Wildcat Hill Water Reclamation Plan is. The reclaim system sort of comes up to Buffalo Park from there um, and down to uh, sort of Jay Lively. We did a release test here into Schweitzer Canyon Wash and then the line comes down into through downtown by Thorpe Park. We release water to Francis Short Pond a couple of months a year when it's dry. The water line comes down to NAU, to Pine Canyon. We did a release test at um, Sinclair Wash. Actually, we, we just ended that test in November. We ran it for about three weeks. And we did a release test a year ago, or actually I think it was like February and March, at Bow and Arrow Wash. So all those locations are upgrading of, of some of our water production wells. Um, so I hope that kind of helps frame in your mind what our approach is to recharge and recovery. Uh, this is a kind of a fun uh, exercise where we used our groundwater flow model to pump our groundwater wells. So this is shop well. I think this is probably interchange and continental, um, Fox Glen and uh, McAllister, or no, this is McAllister, so this is, I think, real well, but in any case, we pump our wells for a hundred years in the groundwater flow model, and we do what's called a particle trace analysis, and this helps us determine what the capture area might be for those wells over a hundred years. So if we are recharging the aquifer within this area, uh, we should be capturing that water at least based on our groundwater flow model. Uh, groundwater flow mo modeling for a fracture rock system like we have is very difficult to do um, super accurately. So we just use this as a tool to kind of help us um, with uh, kind of developing our, our programs. So if we do a recharge and recovery program, this is probably one tool we would look at. And these are tools available to you if you want us to investigate any of these options in more in more detail um, to inform your decisions. So this last graph that I have is a plug for surface water augmentation with advanced treatment of reclaimed water. So the Corolla study that you've glanced at, um, or some of you I know have looked at it in a lot of detail, one of the options we costed at just a kind of conceptual level is a pipeline from our reclaimed system probably from the Rio de Flag plant, um, advanced treating that reclaimed water and putting it directly into Upper Lake Mary. Um, we'd wanna make sure the lake could still be used safely for recreational uses, but having 3,000 to 4,500 acre feet a year pumped into Upper Lake Mary may have some great benefits. I mean, the, the water is very turbid, so I don't know if it would help kind of clean it up a little bit, uh, make it uh, improve the clarity of the lake. Um, but so this is just one graph. We would we would graph this differently and present the data differently to you if we really wanted to explore this option. We're looking at the lake level minimum every year, and we've taken out surface water production from that volume. Um, I believe. <laughs> and this is just kind of a graphical way we could um, explore sort of the benefits of augmentation. So we could 
what I'm thinking one thing we could do here is add um, 3,000 to 4,500 acre feet, whatever uh, uh, additional treated effluent we had each of these years, we could add this in and see how um, likely the lake would be to spill over with that additional water in it. If the lake spills over, then we have an opportunity to recharge the Lake Mary Wellfield area and bring the water table back up over time. Uh, the upper Lake Mary storage capacity is just over 16,000 acre feet. Um, and so this is just kind of an, a way to make a plug for this option. Um, another benefit is if water spills over Upper Lake Mary Dam and happens to spill over Lower Lake Mary Dam, um, we're kind of priming the pump if we can get water in the system that um, then boosts the amount of um, snow melt runoff we have a better chance of, of both dams uh, overflowing and then we would bring water into Walnut through Walnut Canyon National Monument. So when these dams were put into place, we altered the flow, the natural flows that occurred through the National Monument. And I know that would be a benefit to our greater community. So um, just some kind of thoughts on on these options and the benefits that I've kind of um, talked about with others and that you know we'll probably discuss with our community stakeholder committee on reclaimed water. That is the last slide for this um, part one of, of the overall talk and you can visit the website and and uh, view the other uh, videos on these other topics. Uh, thank you so much.